Hello. 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 How are you? Hi, everyone. Doing good. I'm doing fine. Okay, I'm just going to work through. There's a steady flow of people um, waiting to come in, so I'm going to get them all in and then we'll get started right away. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started, slow down a little bit. Um, thank you everybody for being here this evening. I uh, really appreciate you taking some time out of your evening to be here with us to kind of talk you through some, some things that we think are gonna be really beneficial for you um, in this um, e-learning environment. So we're gonna specifically focus tonight on um, supporting literacy at home um, and things that you can do to help your child um, with their literacy instruction and with their literacy work. So we're gonna first um, kind of go through our, our goals for tonight and also go through um, some kind of a, a repeat of what we went through last week, just a quick um, retouch on those things, and then we'll get straight into our um, content for this evening. Um, so just a quick review of last week, um, session one. Um, our Last week we talked about a daily and weekly schedule that consisted of live lessons that's, that teachers will provide to your students. Um, this also includes um, kind of a slightly different schedule depending on grade level. So if you weren't able to join us last week, um, kindergarten, first and second grade students are only gonna have live lessons on Mondays um, for now. And then for our three through five students, they're gonna have those Monday through Thursday with their classroom teacher. And then our middle school students are gonna have a specific schedule for their grade level where they will rotate through their classes and do live lessons with each teacher. Um, for work completion, we've had a lot of questions this week about when work is due. Um, work completion is going to be by the following morning is, is the goal for us. So if your student is completing their work in the evenings because that fits your family's schedule best, we understand that. We just wanna make sure the students are kind of modeling and mirroring what a classroom environment would look like um, traditionally. So we wanna make sure that there is some, some expectation there for students to get their work completed in a timely manner. So we're gonna be looking for work to be completed um, by 8 a.m. the next morning. Teachers will be looking through their assignments um, and checking that um, students are getting work completed. Um, and then navigating technology, that was a big part of our, our discussion last week, um, working through Google, um, and using Google Classroom was a big part of our discussion. If you didn't get a chance to watch that, there's a lot of specifics that we went through that I won't reiterate for everyone this evening, um, but feel free to check out our Facebook page um, or reach out if you'd like to see a copy of that video. Um, we have a video of the whole session, so you, you will easily be able to, to get that information. Um, for our Savas platform, this has been one that has given us a little trouble this week as we've been navigating this. So if you have any issues with Savas, please reach out to your child's teacher um, and we will see what we can do about getting those things navigated and fixed for you as we um, get a little heavier into our, our journey here. Um, and then lastly, IXL is one that we've been use, using a lot um, and having some additional issues there. So um, if you're having trouble with getting logged into IXL or you need your login information, IXL is the one platform that we're using that requires students to log in with anything other than their Google account. So if they know their Google account and password, everything else is really easy. Um, anytime they have the option to click log in with Google, that's always what they should do. So it, IXL is the only one that doesn't allow us to do that. So if you need login information there, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to um, your child's teacher and we can get that information um, put together for you. And then um, lastly, just some um, additional supports that we went through last week um, that you can, you can access through us um, and through our virtual call center. Our FACT team um, is available through 
reaching out to our virtual call center. Um, it's our family and community allies team, and they um, have lots of different um, availability to support in lots of different ways. So if there's anything that you need, please reach out to us. And if we can't answer the question or we can't provide support directly, we'll reach out to our FACT team for that. Um, we also went over meals and meal pickup last week. Um, if you missed out on that, um, meal pickups are going to be on Mondays from 9 to 10 a.m. And schools need to know by 11 a.m. on Tuesday for pickup the following week. So if you um, did not, utilize that extra support and you want to do that now, please just let your, your child's school know by Tuesday so that they can, you can pick up um, for the week following. And then we also have access to counseling services um, through, so just calling that virtual call center, we can connect you with all the right people there. And then um, our technology support is a separate number and we're gonna go through all of those um, phone numbers later later on at the end so you have those accessible. But technology support is gonna be slightly separate to our virtual call center. So if it's things that are specific to navigating the Chromebook, using the Chromebook, having issues with logging in for various things, those technology support um, people are gonna be the ones that you'll wanna reach out to to get those things um, updated and fixed. Um, so as we go through um, our work tonight, if you have any questions about anything that we are covering, please feel free to let us know that um, in the chat box. So our um, Chief Academic Officer, Kyle Beauchamp, is gonna be kind of manning the chat feature this evening. So if you have any specific questions, feel free to type those in there and he can get your answers as we go through the presentation today. Okay, so for today's workshop, um, to get right down to business, uh, we've got a few goals. And again, we're, we're gonna be specifically focusing on supporting literacy at home for your students. Um, so we're gonna do a few things um, to make sure that that is easily accessible to you. One, we're gonna explain the fundamentals of literacy. So when we as teachers say literacy, what do we mean when we say those things? Um, also provide you with some tips, tricks for reading with your students at home, ways to make that as beneficial as possible when you're when you're reading with your students. Um, also providing um, some resources to help you find um, resources for your family and where you can specifically locate good quality resources for your family. And then um, we're also gonna focus on um, kind of the key literacy skills by grade level so that you know exactly what is expected of your student at their current grade level and what we will be working on with them in, in the virtual platform ourselves and then what you can help support at home as well. And then we're going to go through um, just some activities that help support those skills for each grade level. So those are going to be divided into kind of grade level clusters um, depending on grade level what activities are going to be best for you to do there. And then lastly, um, just answer any additional questions you have regarding um, literacy at home or the virtual platform and, and then wrap up for the evening. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and get started um, with the first part of that. Um, and that is, what is literacy? Um, what does that mean for us? Um, and so when we say literacy as a classroom teacher, what that means to us is, um, pretty simply, the ability to read and write well. But when we dive into that as educators and think about um, what specifically that means for us, um, there's a few different parts to that. So foundationally, um, we want students to um, understand different sounds in the words that they hear, um, connect those certain sounds to certain letters, for example, understanding that A says A, ah, um, and then also groups of letters like blends when we're talking about um, BL and knowing the sound that those two letters make when we put them together. And that's just a foundation that helps them build words themselves, but then also helps them understand how to read words. And then um, lastly, kind of in that foundational section, we're looking at connecting certain sounds to certain letters or groups of letters, um, to make sure that they understand how to read those words. And then um, over into kind of some of the more advanced skills, um, understanding or figuring out the meaning of words. So this is where your students start to get into um, a learning situation where they're working on vocabulary. So if students are working on vocabulary, they're specifically trying to understand what words mean and how they're being used in a story or a text that they're reading. And then um, moving on a little further than that, um, reading aloud speaking and writing effectively. Um, so 
kind of all of those things go together as far as an advanced skill, being able to read out loud, speak, and then write using correct um, grammar, using correct understanding of what they're reading, and then using fluency and, and smoothness when they're reading out loud. Um, and then understanding texts that are appropriate for their age, and we'll go into that a little bit a little bit more in depth later when we talk about what's specific to each grade level. Um, but just not only being able to read the text out loud to you, but also understand what they've read and be able to talk to you about it once they've finished. And then lastly, um, writing in response to what they've read. Um, our students in a more advanced um, reading environment are going to be working on um, reading the text and then basing the writing that they're doing in class on the things that they've read and using information in those in those stories and in those texts to support the writing that they're doing. Um, so that brings us to reading with your child when you're doing that at home. Um, just a few tips and tricks from us as far as how that can look for your family and how you can support that, especially as we're doing um, virtual learning and they're not getting that in-class literacy instruction, what that can look like in a more informal environment in your home that you can do um, kind of without a whole lot of extra preparation. So um, first, making reading part of your daily routine. Um, every, every family has a different routine and that routine um, is specific to you. Um, so, you know, when, you, when you're trying to think about how you can build reading into your family's day, um, you're gonna wanna think about what is best for you. So if you're making it part of your routine, we're not telling you when or where you have to do that, but the more that you can read with your child, regardless of what grade level they're in, the better that, that reading is going to be um, for them once they're doing it with their classwork. Um, and as we know, that those reading skills kind of permeate into every single subject that they're working on, even math, to be able to read the problems and answer the problems correctly. So anything we can do to build reading into their day and make that something that they're comfortable with is going to be beneficial for them. Um, another way that we can help support our children at home is just model appropriate reading. And again, we all have different schedules and that looks different for everyone. But one of the things that's really beneficial um, for, our, for our students is seeing the, what, what good reading looks like. Whether you're available to do that yourself as the parent um, and read aloud to your student, or whether you want to have your students listen to other people read, or they have older siblings that can read to them, or older, older siblings or younger siblings they can read too. All of that is great. Um, and, and honestly, the more we can just read, and read and read and read, that's the best thing for us. Um, so another um, resource that I've put in here and linked in here that's a really great one, especially um, when, you're student, when you're trying to work from home or juggle different schedules or things like that and you want your students to have access to high quality reading and models for that, um, is a website called Storyline Online. And this is um, generally some celebrities and famous people, authors, things like that, reading some, some pretty uh, popular children's books and not novels and different things. Um, so students can watch those videos of people that they may recognize from popular culture, reading stories that are engaging um, with appropriate um, reading skills. And so it's just a really great model for students to, to see there. And then lastly, just taking advantage of teachable moments. Um, reading instruction and literacy instruction can kind of happen all the time. Um, there's always an opportunity um, to do that, words, letters, it's everywhere, everywhere we go, it's on signs, it's on the street, it's on, uh, it's everywhere. So um, we kind of can use those moments wherever we are, regardless of what our schedule looks like, to be teachable moments for our students and help support some of the skills that they're working on in class. Um, and then again, listening to your student read aloud. Um, the more you listen to them read, the more you kind of have your finger on the pulse of where they're at in their reading and their reading skills. And so if you need to support them in any way um, in that journey, you, you can either do that yourself or you are aware of their reading and their skills and you can reach out to their teacher if you need any additional support there. Um, so one of the things that's really beneficial when you're listening to your student read is not just to have them do it, but then also ask them questions about the text that they're reading and um, have them talk to you about that text because that helps to support their comprehension of what they're reading and build their skills um, for communicating about what they're reading. 
And then lastly, we want reading to be fun. We want it to be something that children enjoy to do, not something they are just being told that they have to do. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of resources that we have um, as educators that help support us in the classroom, but there's also a lot of those same resources that can be used at home or some additional resources that are specifically developed for parents. So we do have um, a list of resources here. They're all linked that you can click on once we share this presentation out. Um, and so one of the really great ones is PBS Parents and it gives specific um, activities, games, books that um, can be done at home with students to support their, their literacy um, in, and instruction and growth. And then um, the last four are some that we use frequently in class. Um, IXL is one we just talked about before, um, and there are a lot of um, literacy skills available there for all grade levels. Um, reading A to Z is one that is typically geared more towards our elementary students than our middle school students, but a lot of really great resources, texts that can be read, um, and these are things that are being used in your child's classroom. So these things can be used directly at home, even if it, nothing specific has been just assigned to the students. Um, and then New ZLA is another one that is all nonfiction text. And as students get older, those nonfiction texts are going to be really beneficial and, and the majority of the reading that they're going to be doing. And so um, New ZLA is a really great one, and we'll get into a little bit later, that provides students lots of different entry points into those reading assignments and those reading texts because they can access a, a lot of the same texts as anyone else. Um, at any level that they're prepared and ready for. So they can, we can extend their learning and, and um, engage them at a little higher level if need be. We can bring the text level down, but they're still reading the same text about the same topic, um, just to make sure that we're kind of meeting students where they are. And then lastly, um, EPIC is another one that we've used a lot in classrooms. This is one that is free for students to use as long as their teacher has set up an EPIC account. So if, you're, if your child's teacher doesn't have an EPIC account and it's something you're interested in, feel free to reach out to them. Um, it doesn't take much time for them to set it up and then it's, it's access to a huge library of books of varying levels, um, varying lengths, varying topics. So students have a lot of access to even more rich text. Um, in that platform as well. All right, so continuing on about um, on the topic of reading with your child, um, where do we find quality text for our children? So a lot of these things, as we as we just discussed, are going to be the same. Um, but we want to make sure that we're not just giving our kids things to read, but we're giving them quality things to read that are appropriate for them. So um, one of the best resources we have is the public library. And one thing you can definitely do is um, speak to the librarian, ask them to help you find books that your kid is going to find interesting, um, but also they can help you narrow down what books are going to be appropriate for your child's grade level and reading level um, so that they have um, rich text that they can they can take home and read and engage with. Um, we also again have Reading A to Z, New ZLA, Epic, ReadWorks is another one um, that has varying levels of text that we can utilize that have um, strong rich text and it's texts that are both nonfiction and fiction texts. And then for some of our upper grade students, because that's when we start to get to the point that we really need to encourage them to be reading more difficult texts, Common Lit is a really great one that our middle school teachers let really, really enjoy um, using with their students. Um, so lastly, in, in regards to reading with your child, how do you choose appropriate text for your child? Um, how do you know what's appropriate for them? How do you know what is too easy, what is too hard? Um, so there's a few ways as teachers that we do that, and we don't want to totally overwhelm you with teacher lingo and things that we, we are um, trained in doing that we see all the time and make it overwhelming for you. But these are some things that are pretty easy to locate in the text that your students are reading to help you determine whether they are reading texts that are appropriate for them. Um, so a Lexile level is one of the things we utilize to help um, categorize texts depending on grade level or ability level. Um, so the list that we have here on the left hand side is just um, a range for each grade level from kindergarten through eighth grade. Kindergarten doesn't really apply to those Lexile levels because kindergartners are not reading full rich texts yet. Um, but then first grade through eighth grade has ranges for what Lexile levels are appropriate for them. And you will notice each of those Lexile levels kind of overlap with each other. So um, a first grader might be 
perfectly ready to read a text at a 300 lexile level, and a second grader might be ready to read a text at um, a 290, as it says here, and that's okay. Um, kids are going to kind of be able to access text at different levels, but some students are going to be at the high end of that range, some will be at the low end of that range, but this is just kind of examples of text that are appropriate for them. If you have students that are ready for a higher level text, feel free to let them read those as long as it's not um, creating them a frustration that is unnecessary. So when we're looking at texts, um, there's a couple of places you can look. I've given some screenshots and examples of finding Lexile levels on our New ZLA platform articles and then also um, ReadWorks articles. A lot of times the articles are available or, you, or those Lexile levels are available on the articles or you can choose a kind of a drop down box and help switch those around. So the ones for um, for New ZLA, there's a drop down box, just this here that starts with max and then it kind of goes down to a certain um, Lexile level. So if your student is just whizzing through some of the questions that are associated with the article and things like that, feel free to challenge them by asking them to take it a step further or to move it up another level so they have access to, to work that is challenging for them um, so that they're not just sitting at home and getting bored with all the work that they're doing. And then the same is true with our ReadWorks. You can see those kind of there underneath the title of the article, it gives you a word count for those articles. So it kind of helps you know um, what would be appropriate for your children. And then lastly, um, the Department of Education has kind of given us a, um, a scale for what is gonna be appropriate level text for our students. So um, this, this chart here on the right hand side just kind of gives us an idea of what sort of word count we can think about for our students and what we can expect them to see um, when, they, when they take the iLearn test, what sorts of texts they need to have the reading stamina to be able to get all the way through in one sitting um, and then be able to answer questions about. So this is just an example of what those looks like. These two texts here are specifically from third grade and you can see that they kind of fall into that um, mid to upper range of um, length appropriation for those students. So um, if we're looking at um, a text with 695 words, that's going to be kind of at the upper end of what we're expecting of our third graders, whereas that 482 at the bottom, that's a, we should expect our third graders to be able to get through that text at an appropriate Lexile level and be able to answer questions about that. All right, so lastly, um, if, you're, if you're looking into some additional programs for your child to kind of supplement what they're doing in class, help to um, build some more skills for them at home, um, here's a few things that you can consider as you're looking at different apps and games and websites that you come across on your own. Um, are they flying through the program and they're earning prizes and it's a whiz or are they asking for help on every single question and it's making them frustrated. We kind of want to find a balance between those two things. We don't want it to be so easy that there's kind of no point, um, but we don't want it to be so difficult that they are getting frustrated and they're kind of um, Developing a negative relationship with that literacy um, and those reading skills. Um, can they level out of the program in a matter of minutes, kind of back to the same idea? Um, is it keeping your child's attention? Are they, is it something that they will continue to be able to work through and provide an appropriate challenge for them? That's kind of what we want to happen there. Um, one that's pretty um, prevalent at the moment, are there lots of ads and pop-ups that are happening on the app that they're playing? And if that's the case, that can create a lot of distraction and they don't actually get any educational benefit from that because they just spend a lot of time um, either swiping away or actually clicking on those pop-ups and then playing other games that are not really related to what they're supposed to be practicing. Um, are we limiting screen time and adding interactions with actual books? That's gonna be really beneficial for our students. Um, having those books in front of them to read and manipulate and work with is going to be really helpful as well. Um, are we monitoring what programs and apps the children are using instead of giving them kind of free range to just scour the internet and come across things that may not be appropriate for them and then they're kind of spending that practice time doing things that's not really helping them um, learn any particular skills. Um, and then also um, this is going to be a really big one for us as we um, work through virtual learning, is your child comfortable typing on a keyboard? It's okay if that answer is no, um, but that's gonna be a skill that we're gonna wanna support in our children. So um, 
looking for free online typing programs is going to be really helpful, especially um, in any additional time or any supplemental things that you're doing with your students, giving them the opportunity to type and practice locating those letters is going to be really helpful because they're going to be taking those standardized tests online. And if they don't have access to um, or have the skills to type an essay or um, to type out a short answer to a question, they're going to be at a disadvantage when it comes time to do those assessments and those tests because that's a skill that they just haven't developed yet. So we want to give them the opportunity to do that as much as possible. So I'm going to hand things over to our um, K2 expert on the call today. Um, Ms. Camille Starnes is our kindergarten teacher, one of our kindergarten teachers at our Brookside campus. And I'm going to let her kind of talk you through um, some of the key skills for those kindergarten through second grade students. Hi, everyone. Um, like Ms. Backley said, I'm Ms. Starnes, kindergarten teacher at Paramount Brookside. Um, on the screen in front of you, you can see our K2 key literacy skills and you can see um, how the skills um, evolve and change as the students grow and you know transfer into different grade levels so the first under kindergarten would be recognizing letters and letter sounds so I know that um, your students teacher can provide you some great videos with just seeing letters and um, being able to tell what sound that makes this is going to help students be learning how to read if they can, you know, see some letters on a page and start to sound it out on their own. So in first grade that transfers to recognizing and naming their sight words and then in second grade reading and understanding new words. Um, the second on kindergarten is sounding out words. Now in my classroom, I teach students that we read from left to right and top to bottom of a page. So um, you know, if you're learning those foundational skills, practicing direction of pages, where's, where's the left, where's the right, where do we start when we read? Um, and then some of the ways that we do that is, you know, we blend from the beginning to the end. So it would be k at cat, and then taking that skill and dragging it. So cat, and then working on whole word reading cat. Um, in first grade, it would be sounding out new words using vowel and syllable patterns. And then second grade, independently reading texts and working on fluency and comprehension. So being able to understand what they're reading, being able to tell you and verbally what's happening in the story, who are the characters, um, sequencing the order of events um, in kindergarten. We're recognizing on, working on recognizing and producing rhyming words. First grade, that's gonna go into reading a text, working on fluency and comprehension. And then in second grade, understanding the author's purpose for writing. Some additional literacy skills in kindergarten are to retell stories using details from the text. So if the main idea is about camping, um, some details are what do you do when you go camping? What is the order of things that happens? Um, working on kindergarten, answering questions about a story, reading them, and then being able to write uppercase and lowercase letters. Some additional literacy skills in first grade are to retell familiar stories. Um, so asking your child how their day went and talking about it from the beginning to the end, um, answering questions in a text, and then being able to write complete sentences, including starting with the capital letter, finger spaces in between those words, and then the correct punctuation mark. In second grade, students are working on answering questions about the main idea of the story, the key details, and then sequencing the beginning, middle, and end of a text. They're also working on predicting things about a text, so what's going to happen next, and confirming if they were using the correct details. And lastly, in second grade, they're working on building those third and fourth grade skills. So they're going to be practicing writing paragraphs in response to the text that they read. Additionally, some at home activities are to practice recognizing letters or matching letters to a given sound. So you could have um, you know, the whole alphabet in front of your child and have them putting some magnet letters and matching the uppercase and lowercase. 
um, looking at letters around the room or signs when you're driving and pointing them out. Um, second, giving your child three sounds in a word and having them blend together. So one thing that I use in the classroom is um, having a student use their arm is a really great visual. So the first sound goes on their shoulder, the middle or vowel sound will go on their elbow, and the last sound will go on their wrist. So they're showing the motion of pulling all of those sounds together to read. The third point is to find play a game, find the sight word, or go on a sight word scavenger hunt. So you could place sight words all over the room, have your child go around, write them down, identify what they are, see how many they could get, just make it super interactive. Um, fourth, you could give your child a word and ask them to provide a rhyming word. So in the classroom, we teach that um, rhyming words have the same ending sound. So kind of circle that ending sound and have them think of words that have that, that same ending sound as well. Fifth is to encourage your child to draw or write about a story that they heard. This is really working on um, being able to, to teach them to remember or thinking deeper in the story. Um, sixth is to allow your child to practice their typing skills. Like Ms. Bapley said, looking into some free online tools to help with that. You could ask them to type a sentence about their favorite book, food, character, or a topic of interest. Seventh is to allow them to listen to audiobooks in the car or put captions on the television. It's really exposing them to more words in their environment. Eighth is to have your child write friendly letters to classmates, teachers, friends, or family. And ninth would be to encourage your child to illustrate and write paragraphs about a story or text that they read. So some three, five key literacy skills are in third grade. Students will be able to read and understand new words using text clues to independently read a text while working on fluency and comprehension, to read and understand stories, plays, and poems, to understand questions using details from a text, to explain why characters in the story do what they do, um, and to write an essay to inform or persuade. In fourth grade, these skills are turning into being able to read and understand new words using text clues, to independently read a text while working on fluency and comprehension, so understanding what they're reading, to read and understand stories, plays, and poems, and explaining how they are different, so comparing and contrasting these texts, um, being able to answer questions using details from a text and draw conclusions, to explain the important message of a text, and lastly on fourth grade, to write an essay to inform or persuade. Now in fifth grade, these skills are to read and understand new words using text clues, to independently read a text while working on fluency and comprehension, uh, to be able to understand figures of speech and reading, to understand, answer questions and support ideas with text evidence. So being able to say, um, you know, this is my answer, this was the paragraph where I found this, so being able to use those clues as well. Uh, to explain the important message of a text and support with text evidence. And lastly, to write an essay to inform or persuade. Thanks, Camille. I'm going to hand things over to um, Natalie Lutz, um, one of our fourth grade virtual teachers, to talk you through um, some skills um, and some activities that you can practice with your students at home. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so just some things that third through fifth can work on at home with your child. Um, ask your child to write about a text they have read and then read their writing. Um, have your child write the next paragraph or chapter of a text. A great one just to be, have them get a book out, read a book, stop at a chapter, and then have them write their own next chapter. What do they think will happen? What do they think should happen? It's a great way to get them, their mind um, flowing with new ideas and also have them writing a paragraph that continues off of what they read. Um, also, to allow your child to practice their typing skills, ask them to type a sentence about their favorite book, food, character, or a topic of interest. You can also have them listen to audiobooks in the car or put, put captions on the television. 
And also make sure you're asking your child questions about their reading, like what was the story or text about? Who were the characters and what happened to them? How did the story end? And what do you predict will happen next? It's good to make sure the students can read the text, but when you're getting to the third, fourth, and fifth grade level, you wanna make sure they're able to comprehend the text and answer questions straight from the text along with reading it. Thanks, Natalie. Um, one of the key skills, and we kind of just went over this in those, those next things, and we've highlighted them on those pages, but one of the most important parts of um, shifting from um, K2 into third through fifth grade is that students are starting to be expected to not only have ideas and answers to questions, but then support those ideas and answers using the text. So we're gonna, you're gonna see a lot of things um, from your students about um, why did this happen, but how, what detail in the text supports that decision or supports that answer or supports your idea. So they have to be able to not only have ideas, but be able to support the ideas that they have or not only answer questions about a text, but then find something in the text that proves that that answer is true. Uh, we're going to hand things over to Corey Chereau. He's our middle school principal at Brookside um, with lots of experience in middle school literacy. So he's going to talk you through um, the key skills and then activities for middle school students. Yeah, hello families. My name is Corey Chereau, middle school principal at Paramount Brookside. Um, and before that was a English language arts teacher within the Paramount District for the previous eight years. So the topics being covered tonight are uh, definitely near and dear to my teaching experience. So as Ms. Starnes and Ms. Lutz did a great job of walking you through K2 and 3-5, here you see uh, the 6-8 slide looking very similar, but of course with um, new information on it. And I wanna kind of take you through this slide um, sideways so to show the vertical articulation among um, the sixth through eighth grade literacy skills, um, exactly like you saw on the couple slides before this. So starting with um, the first bullet in each column, you can see the similarity, and this is a vocabulary subtopic of literacy. Um, sixth grade is talking about reading and understanding the meaning of new words. Um, AKA context clues would be another uh, synonym for that skill. And then in seventh grade, they're bumping that up to explaining the difference between the definition of a word versus how the author really means by using it. So that's like figurative language. Um, it's raining cats and dogs. The definition of cats and dogs is much different than what the author is meaning by using that phrase. Uh, and then you look in eighth grade and you're kind of getting even bigger than vocabulary, talking about how a text can focus on a specific opinion or even culture. So, uh, you know, higher level thinking there as you um, are getting closer to high school. Second row across is containing mood and tone. Sixth grade says explain how a narrator creates a certain mood in a story. Seventh grade asks us to analyze why an author makes certain choices in their writing. And then eighth grade takes it to thinking about how a text is different depending on who the author may be or who the writer may be. Third row is more of your main idea or your claim uh, terms of ELA literacy. Sixth grade, determine what the author of a text thinks or feels about a topic. Seventh grade, think about how an author explains how they think and feel about a topic. And then in eighth grade, they're analyzing two multiple opinions and deciding how well each argument is made or if one argument is, is supported better than the other. Uh, fourth row across, you're gonna see looks very similar all the way across. It's citing textual evidence. In sixth grade says, uh, use evidence from the text. While seventh grade says, give several pieces of evidence. And eighth grade also mentions we need now several pieces of evidence. So you see that higher level thinking, looking for uh, multiple reasons why you or the author believe what they believe. Um, the second to last row is almost identical all the way across, drawing conclusions from a text. So you can see that skill continues all the way from sixth, seventh, and eighth, drawing conclusions. And the exact same thing in the bottom row, writing to uh, inform a reader or persuade a reader as well as edit work, revise the writing um, after it's done and, and you want to proofread it and make it better. 
seventh grade is doing those exact same processes, of course, on a uh, higher seventh grade level and eighth grade in the same way with more complex texts uh, to be read first and then written about second. So again, the, these slides that Ms. Starnes and Ms. Lutz have walked us through um, really show that vertical articulation. And then the next slide will continue on with the um, strategies at home. So the sixth through eighth grade at home literacy activities would be uh, many things, but here's just some, of course, heavily recommended suggestions. We start with number one, um, asking your child to write about a text they have read, and then you kind of, you know, being the teacher and reading what they wrote, um, so that's turning around and kind of, you know, summarizing someone else's writing is a huge skill in middle school. Number two, when your child states an opinion, ask them how they came to that conclusion. That's deep down citing textual evidence, whether it's in conversation or in writing or typing. Uh, number three suggestion is to watch a movie related to a reading, a book or a topic that the child has read and then just have a discussion or a written discussion about connections they notice between the two. You're looking at comparing and contrasting similarities and differences with that skill. Suggestion number four is to challenge your child to use a wider variety of words in instances of life. Uh, avoid words, for example, like good, and encourage them to use more specific, more power words, um, adjectives and nouns and verbs that really let uh, the person who's listening or reading the writing um, get you know the the five senses involved in the conversation or the reading and finally just like um, in the third through fifth slide asking your child questions about the reading a what is the text about that summary b how does the reading make you feel that's mood or tone c what do you think the author is trying to teach you that's main idea or theme which is huge and D, how do you think the story will end? Once again, asking your child to draw conclusions or make predictions. Thanks, Corey. Um, so a couple of things just to go through with you um, that these will be available to you on this slide, but um, a lot of the suggestions we've made to you tonight and a lot of are, are kind of a combination of, of a few things and our own experiences, but also some things that are um, provided to us by the Indiana Department of Education for each grade level and specific to each grade level. And they have a really easy to follow um, and beneficial um, family guide for literacy. And they're divided up into elementary and middle school. So those are linked here in case you want a few more ideas or you have any other questions um, that could be answered through that um, family guide there. So those, are, those will be linked on those slides. Um, and then again, Feel free to join us next week. We will be doing this as a four part series. So we are halfway through. Um, next week will be number three of four and we're gonna focus um, similar to tonight on our math support um, and how we can support those math skills at home for our virtual learners. Um, that'll be again at 6 p.m. and there will be um, a Zoom link invite sent out through Facebook, um, through email, through Google Classroom for, for your family um, to access. And then lastly, um, just another reiteration of our contact information. Um, our virtual school call center um, is that 317-910-8551 number. That number is available for phone calls uh, um, related to virtual learning from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day, Monday through Friday. Um, so if you have questions about your students' work, anything that you um, are having trouble with or you um, have questions specific to the virtual program, feel free to reach out to us at that number. Um, the, as we talked about earlier, the trajectory technology support, um, they're gonna be our go-to people for anything related to the use of the Chromebooks or um, even some of the websites that we're using in class, they can help support there or reroute you to the right person. Um, so that number is listed there as well. And then lastly, um, if you have any specific questions, prefer email, uh, feel free to email your child's teacher directly, especially if it's related to class content because they're gonna be the experts on that topic. Um, it's designed by them, it's, it's let out by them, so they're gonna be able to answer your questions much better than I will. Um, but then anything additional other than that that you have questions about, I'm happy to answer those and my email is listed there for you to uh, for you see. So if you need to reach out, feel free to do that and we're happy to answer any of your questions. So again, we thank everybody for being here tonight. 
Um, hopefully we were able to answer most of your questions in the chat. And if not, um, we're happy to reach out to you um, individually and get those questions answered as needed. Um, if you have any questions um, after tonight's meeting, again, contact us um, directly to any of those contacts listed above. Thanks everybody.